Okay, so this is 641, and today we're going to finish up the material and causal uh, modeling, causal Gaussian models. So we are going to do the 1 and 2D case hopefully today, okay? So last time, what I basically told you, okay, and ask questions please, because it's a small class, so that's really wonderful. You know, I haven't had the opportunity to have small classes. Actually, I was thinking about things, and I'm thinking that maybe what I'll do is, like, for the final, we could do, uh, like, not exactly a project. I mean, well, sort of a project. I'm sort of thinking, like, a reportish project. Like, um, not just, uh, like, like, uh, uh, like go and read some papers on a topic, write up something that describes it in detail, and maybe uh, maybe do some kind of computed simulations, and maybe make like a 10-minute video, okay? Because the problem is if everybody has to present, that becomes like more, I mean, that ends up being like two weeks of classes or something. So, but if everybody, and plus you can't physically be here to do it. So maybe everybody can make like a two minute, uh, a 10 minute video or maybe a five minute video. 10 seems like the appropriate amount because 10 minutes goes pretty fast. Just uh, sort of reporting on your report. So there would be maybe a written component and then a video component and then you'd read some papers on a topic. So I could give you a list of approved, pre-approved topics. I'm just thinking out loud here, okay? Uh, I could give you a list of pre-approved topics, and then you could, if there's something that you're interested in that's not on that list, then you could, you know, counter-propose, okay? Also, um, try to make it so everybody has their own topic. I did this actually many years ago, back when the class was, how many, how many people, okay, maybe I shouldn't tell you this by will anyway, because you know me, I'm not very good at keeping secrets. Um, does anybody know Professor Comer? Okay, she took this class, okay? And just in case, like this is sort of um, extortion material, I have her report, okay? <laughs> I actually have her report, it was pretty good, okay? In fact, what we did is I made it into like a book that year where I published everybody's report on their project. So hers is in there. So. So may we do something like that? How many people think that would be fun? How many people think that would be scary? <laughs> How many people think it would be fun and scary? Yeah, okay, good, all right. So um, yeah, just kind of thinking out loud there. Okay, now here's the thing. Okay, so you have, I like to think of the, you know, there's two, ways you draw little, these are basically like graphs, okay? This is a 1D graph, okay? Like this, okay? So we use graphs in this class to illustrate dependencies between things. And in fact, a lot of these people, people will call these graphical models really, and they are, but I don't refer to them that way because, you know, I don't know, it's fine, whatever. Markov over in the fields, Markov chase, all this stuff we're learning are known as graphical models, okay? So, you know, if that sounds like kind of a sexier term or something, that, that's good. Then think of it that way. If you don't like it, then don't pay any attention. Okay, so it's, these are like graphical models from machine learning. And this is xn, okay, right? And this is like xn minus 1, okay? So what happens is that you take the past, okay? So this is x less than n, okay? And this goes into here, it goes into a box, which is the predictor box, okay? So this is estimator. This is the minimum mean square error uh, estimate, okay? And it comes out here, and so this is xn hat, right? And then this is xn, and what comes out of here is epsilon n, okay? So epsilon n is equal to xn minus x hat n, which is equal to xn. Now we're assuming this is zero mean Gaussian and stationary. 
So I stationary means wide sense stationary or strict sense stationary because since it's a ga jointly Gaussian random process, it's got a, they're the same. Okay. Uh, wide sense stationary means that that the mean and autocorrelation is not a function of time. And strict sense stationary means that the entire distribution is not a function of time. But if the mean and the correlation auto, uh, define the distribution for a multivariate Gaussian. So therefore, if, one, if that's invariant, it's got to be invariant. All its distributional properties need to be invariant. So this is this, OK? So this is x minus the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of hk times x of n minus k. So this looks like convolution. Uh, H, and we talked about this last time, this unfortunate notation. But OK, that you write that as convolution like this, right? Uh, what that really means is it means H convolve with x. Because convolution, <laughs> OK, I hate to beat this to death, but since it did come up last time, this is a scalar value, right? Is the value of h at some time n, right? And this is a scalar value. So any function of those two is only a function of those two scalar values. But that's not what convolution is. Convolution is an operator that takes in two functions and produces another function, right? So, so this is really a misleading notation. We should really write it like this, OK? Because that would be like this, this, this convolves the two functions and then evaluates it at some point in time. But we don't because I can't, look, it's hard enough for me dealing with the administrators of Purdue. I can't change the notation, <laughs> okay, in these, in these uh, areas, okay? So, yeah, you can only fight with society to, so much, okay? So, so you got to go with it, okay? And, um, so h of n here is also, uh, it's, uh, it's equal to h of n for n greater than 1, OK? And it's equal to 0 for n less than or equal to 0, OK? So, so um, h of n is some kind of function at time 0. OK, at time 0, it's 0. At all these times, it's 0, OK? Over here, it's something else, OK? You know, I don't know why. Something, OK? It turns out it can't be just anything, OK? There's going to be some constraints, but uh, we don't know what they are right now, all right? Yeah? It's maybe picky on notation. Shouldn't be n greater than or equal to 1 for each of them? Because it can be something like right. 1. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. That's correct. Thank. You. Yeah, be picky. It's. I don't like having errors like that because it'll create confusion. Actually, when you correct me on something like that, it's reassuring to me because then I, then I know you're following it. Okay. So, don't don't hesitate. Don't be shy about that. And I like a lot of errors, so please correct them. Okay. Um, okay. So that's good, right? Oh, and it's this is because it's stationary. So, uh, so it has to be a convolution. If it wasn't stationary, it wouldn't necessarily be. A, it wouldn't be a convolution. Okay, other, or the other way to think about it, it would be a time-varying impulse response. Okay, yeah. Are you calling the interval process x as stationary? X is stationary. That doesn't make sense because I don't think the moments are the same. Do they happen to be same? Say that again. For example, the expectation of xn is it independent of m because I, I find it hard to see. Well, first of all, I'm I'm making the assumption that x of n equals zero. Okay, that's without loss of generality. It's really trivial to have a non-zero, but we're just making a zero. So for this particular case, it's clearly not a function of n. Okay. By the way, that is recording, right? Just, yeah, there you go. Because now I'm paranoid, OK? OK, so uh, let me just go back over what it means to be stationary, OK? 
because stationarity is a very subtle concept that's very important, okay? So you have a signal like this, okay? It's some kind of signal, but the signal is not, it's not a fixed signal, it's a random process, okay? So when I draw the signal, I'm drawing, sometimes people call this a sample path. Okay, in other words, it's like you flip the coin and this is a result of, of an outcome of the experiment, okay? So, so xn is a set of random variables, right? So each of them is really a function of omega, all right? So what this is, is it, it's a sample, it's like the value of xn for some particular omega. Now you'd say like which omega, okay? It gets very complicated, I don't want to go into it, okay? Really the concept of a sample path is a little bit, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say, I mean, I don't want to offend anybody because it can, it can be made rigorous, but the way people usually use it is a little bit not totally rigorous, okay? Like it's, it's a little of a, you know, sometimes like, uh, here would be another example. You have a coin, you flip it. People would say that the particular outcome of a coin flip is a realization of the random variable. You know, I don't know. It's like, okay, I'm not exactly sure what a real is. It's helpful to talk about because students get confused. And the reason students get confused is because random variables are mathematical objects, okay? They're exactly what we say they are. There's these. And if you want to, okay, of course, I haven't told you exactly what they are. I've sort of told you what they are. But if you really want to know in detail what a random variable is, you need to take a rigorous course on probability, which 600 is great. I'm not picking on 600, but they don't do measure theory in 600, right? So you'd have to take a really formal course in probability. Then once you've been through that once, you'll be like, oh, thank God it's over, and I never have to learn it again. But now I know it, okay? And it'll all be clear, okay, hopefully. But, but now it's a little mushy because I haven't gone into every detail, okay? But remember, uh, a probability, a random variable is a function, right? It's a function from omega to the real line. So it's a purely mathematical object. That's why I always like to say a pizza is not a random variable, okay? Because a pizza is not a random variable. A pizza is a pizza, OK? A coin flip is not a random variable, because a coin flip is a physical event. A random variable is a purely mathematical concept. It only exists mathematically, OK? So there's two worlds here. I know this may seem silly, and I spend too much time on it, but I think it's really important, because otherwise you're just going through the motions. You're turning the crank, but you don't really understand what you're doing, OK? Over here is math and logic. Over here is the physical world. Oh, I wish my phone would stop doing that. I need to have, learn how to turn the damn thing off, but it's the master of my life, unfortunately. So this is the physical world here, and this is the mathematical, logical world, and they are connected through models. So when we say that the coin flip is a random variable, we're really just saying it's not really a random variable. It's just we model it as a random variable, OK? So, so a random process is now a collection of random variables. So we can say, what would a typical realization of that random process be? So in other words, if we were like going to generate samples from that distribution, OK? Like, what would they look like? Whatever the heck that means, generate samples from the distribution. We'll talk about this stuff more. So it would look sort of like this. But there aren't, I don't want to confuse you, but you'd say, but the, it gets subtle, OK? I'm afraid to tell you some of these things, so I'm afraid I'll really confuse you, OK? But let me just say them anyway. If I have a random variable, OK? And the probability that the random variable equals minus 1 is equal to the probability that the random variable equals 1 is equal to 1 half, OK? Right? So this is like a coin flip, right? So then I can say x equals, OK, but what's, 
what's the probability that x equals 0? It's got to be 0, right? Because these two cover everything, right? So now I'm going to ask you, can x be equal to 0? OK, well, what does that mean to ask that question? What it means is, does there exist an omega which is a set of part of omega such that x of omega is equal to 0? The answer is yes. OK? So it's possible that there's an omega such that x of omega equals 0, but that the, that event occurs with probability 0. So that's like throwing a dart. The probability you hit bullseye maybe is 0. But it doesn't mean you can't hit bullseye. It just means you hit it with probability 0. Honestly, the probability distribution doesn't tell you anything about whether the random variable can equal 0. Because it's also possible that, that x never, there is no, this, this may be true, or this may not be true, right? Interestingly, whether or not it's true has no effect on the probability distribution. <laughs> so the probability distribution specifies the random variable to some degree, but not uniquely. Okay. Well, first of all, there could be, you could have an infinite number of random variables which all have the same probability distribution. They could be independent. But even if a ran, but you can have you could have two random variables which are equal almost surely, which means that the probability of them being equal is one. Okay, so they're the same, and yet they're not the same because on at points where their probability are zero, they're different in value. Okay, it's a technical point. Okay. Why did I digress into all this? Because you asked me what these sample paths look like. And the answer is that, well, there could be all kinds of sample paths in here that look all messed up and are completely inconsistent with your model of what the random process should be. But they occur with probability 0. So this is sort of a typical sample path. But if I take a window, I mean, and that's why stationarity is such a complicated thing to understand, because it requires that you think about the actual random process as opposed to its realization. Like students, OK, one of the things that's really cool, you can basically make money off some of this stuff. OK, so you guys like money, right? OK, good. Just checking. Like, you know, in the stock market and stuff, I mean, like, don't be stupid because you can do stupid things. But, but, um, but you can make money off random process. That's what, like, these companies do. That's why they hire people take classes like this on Wall Street. Not that you should necessarily take those jobs, because sometimes they're not. They're OK. It depends on what you like in life, OK? okay. <laughs> but but th knowing this stuff is, has a real world consequence in that sense, because you model these random processes, OK? Because people in the financial industry took them a long time to get their head around probability, OK? Because people just naturally tend to think like, for instance, Purdue administrators don't understand probability at all, OK? Because like, you could ask them, like, is this going to happen? And their answer is always yes or no, OK? They don't, or they don't answer you, OK? Because they don't understand the idea of a probability distribution. It's too abstract for their little brains, OK? So the thing is that what happens is that as you go along like this, right, if you look at a little piece of this, OK? Clearly, the function changes, OK? It's got to change when you look at a realization. Otherwise, it would just be constant. We're not asking about the function. It's real, this actual, once it's a realization, it's like a regular function. It's not random anymore, OK? What we're asking is the random process, which I can't draw. See, that's the fundamental problem. I can't draw a random process. Like, I can't draw a random variable. I can't. That's why the way I re represent a random variable is like this, x, OK? And then you say, well, what's x equal to? I'm like, I don't know, because it's a random variable, OK? I can't, and you ask me to draw the random process. I can't draw the random process, because it doesn't actually take on a specific value. That's the whole idea. It's, it's random, OK? So the question is, if I slide a window like this, is, and, I, and inside that window, I only look at the random process. Then the question is, can I tell from the random process where I am in time? OK? 
That's a really sort of, in a sense, that's a very deep philosophical question. If I slide a window and I look at the random process, can I tell where I am in time? Okay? If I can't tell where I am in time, it's stationary. If I can tell where I am in time, it's not stationary. So now, in a physical world, so then you can ask yourself, well, are pizzas stationary? Okay? But it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask, are pizzas stationary, right? So what's the answer? Well, there are many answers. What's the first and truest answer? There you go. Pizza's not a random variable, okay? So here's what pizzas look like, okay? Specifically pepperoni pizzas. Okay. Okay, now, so then the next question goes, well, it's not stationary because it's not a random process, so therefore it's not stationary, right? So then you say, well, okay, but I, you know, that's not really the question my boss wanted the answer to, okay? What they, the boss said was the piece is stationary, but like, you know, if I take my boss completely literally and tell my boss the truth, the boss is going to just fire me, okay? So instead I have to reinterpret what the boss said in some kind of way that's more meaningful and will give a reasonable answer to the boss's question, okay? So what the boss is probably asking you is, can I model it as being stationary, <laughs> okay? Because it's clearly not stationary because it's not a random process. But the question is, well, will this be a reasonable model? By the way, if you're a material scientist, this is really not such a ridiculous question. Because a pizza is kind of an example of a material. So the question is, is the material, this could be the microstructure of the material, is the material stationary? Is the random process that I model this material with stationary? Should I model with a stationary random process? Okay. Well, on the edge, it's clearly not stationary because that's different. Well, obviously, it, it's not well modeled as stationary on the edge, right? But if I'm in the middle, well, I don't know. If the pepperoni is distributed kind of uniformly, like random points, then yeah, maybe that's a pretty reasonable model, OK? Because I, if, I, if I only take a little picture like this, and I can't see the rest of it, can I tell where I am in the pizza? Uh, maybe not. Maybe. But you know, it's not a ridiculous model, OK? So that's stationary, OK? Very important concept. Uh, you know, here is, I have a portrait of a person. Is that stationary? Eh, maybe not. But people use stationary models to code images of portraits all the time. Although you could probably do a little better by segmenting it and encoding the different pieces differently, right? Okay. Or and that's okay, so so maybe not, but if I took a picture, if I took an aerial photograph from a satellite of an agricultural area, right? Would that be modeled well stationary? So, you know, maybe I'd have like farm fields like this. And over here I'd have like a sprawling little city with some roads. Yeah. Is that stationary? Well, it kind of depends. You'd say, well, this is different than that. But that I know that this was going to fall in this particular position. Not really. So I would argue this is stationary. Okay? As long as you didn't decide in advance where you were going to take the picture. If you're always going to take the picture from the same position, then then it's not very well modeled as stationary because you know the city's always going to be there. But if it's taken as sort of a if the satellite goes and then at some random time you snap a picture, then maybe it's pretty reasonably modeled as a stationary random process, okay? Because you can't Right, OK. It's, fills, it's not a random process, so it's not stationary. But the question is, is it modeled? What it means to be stationary, it means that if the actual random process is distribution, it's not a function of time. 
Now, if it's, a ga if it's a Gaussian random process, the distribution is defined by its mean and covariance, right? If the mean is a function of time, then clearly it's not stationary. Because then I could use the mean to try to at least eliminate some times that it can't be at, right? If I can get any information about the time from the observation of the random process, then it's not stationary. So if the mean is a function of time, it's not stationary. If the covariance is a function of time, it's not stationary. If neither the mean nor the covariance is a function of time, so if the covariance is a function of time, is not a function of time, that means that the expected value of xn times xm uh, is some function r of n minus m. This is not a function of time. If both these properties hold, this could be a constant. It doesn't have to be 0. If both these properties ho hold and the random process is Gaussian, then its distribution is not a function of time. So th uh, in this particular, this is a random process with these properties is called wide sense stationary. If it's wide sense stationary and it's Gaussian, then it's strict sense stationary. If it's wide sense stationary but it's not Gaussian, then then it may, may not be stationary, right? It may not be strict stand stationary because it could be, OK, the first and second order properties are, are not a function of time, but maybe higher order properties are a function of time, right? And I think there's an ex a homework problem where you have to generate a counterexample, OK? And then later, we're going to talk about a concept called reversibility. Reversibility is. Uh, it's emotionally similar to stationarity, OK? But instead of it, because stationarity is about invariant, a time invariance of a random process, right? Like you know about linear time invariant systems, right? But the problem is, is OK, linear time invariant systems make, pretty, make sense. Or just the time invariant systems make sense, right? It means that the system's behavior does not depend on time. But what does it mean for a signal to be time invariant? Well, literally speaking, if it's time invariant, it means it just doesn't change with time, which means it's just constant. It's kind of boring. So with random processes, time invariance becomes a much richer concept. Because that means that the distributional properties are not a function of time. But the actual random process, of course, changes with time. Right? Its realizations change with time. So, so fine. So, uh, so then. Reversibility says that the random process's distribution doesn't change when you reverse it. <laughs> OK, when you reverse it. So it's invariant to reversal. So one is invariant to time. Another one is invariant to reversal. OK? Invariance properties are super important in information processing. In fact, everything we're learning for the next few chapters is all about invariance. Because and why is invariance so important? The problem is, is that if you don't assume some kinds of invariance, like symmetry is an invariance, right? So a snowflake is symmetric. It has an invariance property, which is that if you flip it, it remains the same, OK? Symmetries are very important. Invariances are very important because they lower the dimensionality of things. If you don't have invariance, then everything is a function of everything is a function of everything. You, it's, it's, it's very rich, but it's not very interesting, <laughs> OK? Because there's hardly anything you can say, and you can't deal with it. It's just too complicated, OK? OK? But if you start implying invariance, OK? If you use invariance, then it's simple, it puts a constraint on the world which simplifies it. And the simplicity makes the problems more solvable, OK? The trick is to put simplicities, info, in, enforce invariances that are correct. If you enforce invariances that are incorrect, then you just get garbage. Okay? This is what modeling is all about. So the trick in modeling is to come up with models that are as simple as possible, but not too simple in the world. What is the Albert Einstein famous quote, I think, that, that a model should be as simple as possible and not any simpler, <laughs> or something like that. Okay? 
All right, so that's the key of what we're doing here, which reminds me of a joke I gotta tell, even though I know that you'll think it's bad, but I think it's bad, so you definitely will. So, okay, so the guy, person goes to the, the okay, so there's a big ad in the newspaper, and they go, the local chicken farm comes out and says they're having a crisis because they can't get the chickens plucked efficiently. So they contact the local university, and the physics professor goes and they goes and says, "Okay, I'm going to go over there and see if I can answer your get, help you out." So they explain the the problem to the physics professor. So the physics professor says, "Okay, I need like a few weeks to study the problem." So the physics professor goes off and analyzes everything, and the physics professor comes back. They have like a big slideshow and, and everything. Okay, the presentation. The room's full. Physics professor starts off and says, assume that a chicken is a sphere. <laughs> I don't know if anybody said. Yeah, so if you assume a chicken is a sphere, plucking a chicken is pretty easy, okay? <laughs> the problem is it's not a very accurate assumption, okay? <laughs> assume a chicken's a sphere. So if you ever hear me say, assume a chicken's a sphere, you'll know what I'm thinking, okay? All right, we got this? Very important, very important. That's why this field is very interesting because it lives at the boundary between mathematics and the physical world. It's not really just about mathematics and it's not just about the physical world. It's about working them together, okay? Okay, so you have this thing, so this is, so the interesting thing is here. En is, is I, I, D, N, zero, sigma, epsilon squared. Oh. So amazingly, uh, epsilon N, the residual error from this, the prediction error, is white Gaussian noise. In two, I can go through the proof, okay? But I won't. You can go through the proof, it's in the notes. Why is it true? Okay, this is the proof right here, by the way. Okay, right there. You can just, I'm gonna skip it, okay? Because you can read it, and do read it. Why is it true? It's true because epsilon n has had all the past information squeezed out of it, okay? The only thing that's left, this is just the additional new information from the current sample, okay? So the additional new information from each sample is independent of the additional new information from each previous sample. So consequently, these, these epsilons have to be independent of each other. They, or they have to at least be uncorrelated. And because they're Gaussian, they have to be independent. So that's kind of a cool thing. And what happens is that, okay, now what happens is that, okay, now you can also write this thing in vector notation. So you can write here epsilon epsilon is equal to uh, uh, okay is equal to x minus x hat. So what do I mean by that? I mean that this is epsilon 1 through epsilon n. It's a time sequence, okay? And this is equal to x1 through xn. It's also a time sequence. Minus, now this is x hat 1 through x hat n. Okay? Right? Now this thing here then is x minus, okay, this guy, these are linear transformations of the original axis. So I'm going to put an a here. This is a. And then here, this is x. So what's the form of a? Well, uh, let me fill this in because I think maybe visually it'll be helpful. This is x1 through xn. OK? Well, OK, this thing, x epsilon 1, is x1 minus um, Okay, well, okay, time is going in this direction, by the way. 
So x1, actually it turns out that epsilon 1 is just x1. Because what happens is there is no past. It's sort of like the starting up issue, OK? So this is all going to be zeros all here, right? Now epsilon 2, epsilon 2, that's going to be, oh, it's going to be h1 times x2. And then, uh, oh, yeah, this is a 0. And then this is a 0. So what's going to happen? And then this one here is going to be h1, h2. And over here, this will be h1 through hn minus 1. So this matrix here, A, this is the matrix A. This is lower triangular. A lower triangular matrix represents a causal linear operator because it's using the past samples in the processing of the, to produce the current sample. Okay. So, so the upshot here is this. That we can write this in matrix notation. It's much more compact. The more compact notation is that, is that epsilon equals x minus ax. And I can rewrite that as that i minus a times x is epsilon. OK? Everybody's good with that? Now, one thing is, so this is what's cool. So I can write down the probability distribution of epsilon. Because the epsilons are IID, and they're all Gaussian with variance 1. So it's easy enough to write that down. That's going to be equal to, I'll just write 1 over z here, because I can always figure out what that constant is. And then I'll put x, x, uh, exponential of minus 1 half, right? Then this will be uh, epsilon n squared. And then I'll have a sigma epsilon squared here. You agree with that? Is that good? Oh, no, it's not good. It's wrong. OK, because I have to do the sum from n equals 1 to n of epsilon n squared, right? Now, OK, you're right. I cheated a little bit, OK, because um, uh, when I assume that this thing, the epsilons, all are IID, okay, that was assuming that this random process was stationary and started at minus infinity. But here I'm not starting it at, uh, I'm not starting at minus infinity. So clearly x can't be stationary because it's not, for something to be stationary it has to be infinitely long and this is only finite long, okay? So I have to play a little slide of the hand because I'm trying to do the discrete case and the continuous case together, right? So, so uh, just go with it that the expected value of epsilon is equal to 0. And the expected value of epsilon times epsilon transpose is equal to sigma squared i. OK? I, so it's, I'm just making that as an assumption, OK? What would really happen is if this a uh, if this random process if this if this uh, is a, um, a minimum mean square error predictor, typically what would happen is that the variance would start up higher and then drop down because these are first ones you couldn't predict quite as well, right? But just for simplicity, let's leave it like this, okay? So now, okay. So this so you're good with this, right? I can rewrite this as the exponential. Uh, minus 1 over 2 uh, sigma epsilon squared norm of epsilon squared. Because the sum of the squared of these entries is the norm squared, assuming this is Euclidean norm. All right? And now this thing here I can write, it's going to be 1 over 2 pi sigma epsilon squared to the n over 2. Can you see that? I don't know why they put this crazy thing here, which I don't even like, right in the middle of the way. Huh? 
Oh, maybe I can just pop this baby down. There's a little gizmo. How do I do it? Do you see like a, there must be something you push on or. Something you have on screen. Huh? There's something you have on screen. Okay. Uh, I know that, okay. They just keep making these things better and better every time I like them more. What the heck? Hold on. I know I had this thing moving before. You would think you'd push it in the sides or something, right? Okay. I could use a sledgehammer, but probably Purdue would get mad at me. So I'll just do that. How's that? <laughs> is this good? So you get it? Okay, now this is the probability distribution episode. Now, if you have, you, if you have, um, if, uh, if you have that like y is equal to b times x, right? And the probability density function of x, okay, is something, right? Then it turns out that the probability of the distribution of y, human y, is going to be, and this kind of makes sense, uh, actually, let me do it the other way. Uh, like that, okay? It's going to be, they need to replace the bulb here. Uh, it's going to be Px, and then in x here, I put By. Sort of makes sense, right? So in other words, you take Y, you apply the transformation to get the corresponding value of x. And you'd say, if, if the random processes were discrete, then you'd say, like, you flip a coin, heads, I jump up in the air, tails, I uh, throw a water balloon at the wall, OK? So then the probability of throwing the water balloon at the wall is the probability of gaining heads, OK? So in that sense, if I apply the transformation and I ask the probability of x, it sort of should tell me the probability of y, except for that's wrong. Is wrong because these are not probabilities, they're probability densities. Right? So what it's not accounting for is the fact that let's say B is a scalar. B might be less than one, it might be greater than one. Okay? In which case you got like two knobs. You're moving one knob, you move this knob, then that moves up, right? It might be you move this a little bit and that moves a lot. Or it might be that you move this a little this a lot and that moves a little bit. Okay? So you have to account for that sensitivity associated with the gain of the transformation, OK? So to handle that, you've got to put a constant here. And the constant, I can never remember. But maybe let's just take a guess at it, OK? You, you divide by like the determinant of v, I think. Let's take a guess. That might be correct or it might be wrong. Either multiply or divide by the determinant of v, OK? So if y is, if small changes in y produce big changes in b, that would be, to have big changes in x, then what happens is that the, prob the density is the probability per unit change, OK? So I don't know. Maybe that's right. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, in the notes, it says, OK? And the reason I can't remember whether it's right or not is because for our particular example, this is actually, um, so in our particular example, this is epsilon. Oh, OK, let me not mess with this because it's, the only thing is it would be really nice if I knew this is correct. Hold on, because I hate to write something in the notes that's incorrect. The, does, is it this way or the other way? I'm pretty uh, certain it's that way. It's this way? Let's see, because if x, the probability, yeah, I think this is this way. I feel like it's this way, OK? The, the, the mathematical Ouija board in my head tells me it's correct, OK? But if it's not correct, I apologize, OK? So here we have epsilon equals a times x, right? Now we have, we know what the probability of, um, oh, shoot. OK. Uh, uh, 
Right. Yes. Right. So the probability of. Oh, no, no. Hold on. The probability of x. Now we have the probability of y. I got this mixed up. OK. This is the probability of y. OK. And the probability of x. Oh, let me not. OK. Now I'm going to really screw it up. OK. I have no choice. So I have to follow through. Probability of x given x, right? is equal to the probability of y of b of x, I think I had it messed up, times 1 over the determinant of b. I think I screwed that up, sorry. Uh, so you probably, yeah, so this is the, we want the probability of x, we know the probability of y, we plug this into that, yeah. That makes more sense, OK? I, I, what I wrote before may have been correct, too, but it wasn't the right thing for what we needed. Or it might have been wrong. OK. In any case, here's the point. So p of x, p of epsilon, you know, is equal to some constant times the exponential of minus 1 over 2 sigma squared epsilon norm of epsilon squared. Right? OK. So p of, um, p of x, then, of x, is going to be equal to p of epsilon. And then what we put, do is we put ax in here. That's the key trick. And we, I think, divide by the determinant of a. But the reason I'm not sure is because here's the th thing that's interesting. a, OK? looks like this. Oh, uh, it's i minus a. Ah. Well, you guys are impressing me because you actually know the correct answers. OK. The important thing here is that i minus a looks like what? It's got ones on the diagonals. It's 0 over here. And over here, these are like h1. This is h1, h2. OK? What's the determinant of this matrix? A determinant, a matrix which is lower triangular or upper triangular with ones on the diagonal has a determinant of 1. So the determinant of i minus a equals 1. So the gods smile on us, and we don't even have to worry about this multiplying factor. That's called the, the uh, Jacobian, right, of the transformation. So it's just like when you're doing a multidimensional integral, and you have to, you know when you do like integration in polar coordinates, and you multiply by like r d theta dr? That's the Jacobian of the transformation. It's the same concept, OK? So, so the upshot is this. For a random process like this, a causal Gaussian random process, you can write down the probability distribution of the random process. And it's 1 over z exponential of minus 1 over 2 sigma epsilon squared and this becomes, um, this is, uh, um, right, it's uh, x transpose bx, where b is equal to, um, right, it's equal to i minus a transpose i minus a. And in the notes, I think I called, I give this a name. Oh, shoot. OK. Oh, I call it H. Oh, I, OK. I mix, I reverse my notation. Because in the notes, I call this, I call this H. And I call that A, OK? Uh, I'm sorry. So I, I swapped my letters. Okay. 
I should have checked my notes to make sure I was using the right letters. So basically, OK, so, so um, oh my gosh, I made a mess of the notation. I apologize. But in the notes, let me just show you the notes so that way you see what they look like. I'm going to just do this real fast. It doesn't look like anybody's standing out there, so they're not getting mad at us yet. OK, so x hat is h times x. h here is, is uh, defined as, um, where is h defined? It's i minus a, where a is the, uh, oh, no, no, a, OK, yeah, yeah, here it is. I got it reverse. So a is i minus h. OK? And so what ends up happening is, oh, OK, I divided where I should have multiplied. OK, well, this is the, co now this is the distribution of x. So you can write it in closed form is the beautiful thing about it, right? And here, because the determinant of a is, is 1, the determinant of that product there Rx, this is the covariance. And the determinant of the covariance is just the determinant of lambda. Lambda is the uh, diagonal matrix of variances for the prediction error. If it's the stationary random process, that's a constant. It's sigma squared times i. So that if you have a, if you have a matrix whose, um, if you have a matrix which is, if you have b equals sigma squared times i, the determinant of b is what? Does anybody know? Sigma squared, sigma squared, Almost, but not exact. You're completely wrong, but oh, very close. <laughs> OK? Because uh, the determinant of i is what? 1. So then the determinant of sigma squared times i, you might think is sigma squared, time, is sigma squared right? Which is sort of what you said, but it's not. Yeah, it's to the power, it's sigma squared to the power of the dimensionality of the matrix, which in this case I think we said was uh, n, OK? And the interpretation, uh, by the way, of the determinant is the volume of an element. So if you, if you, in a multidimensional space, if you take a little hypercube right, of unit volume, OK, and you transform it to the other space, the determinant is the volume of the, of the transformed cube. OK? <sighs> Someone's got to just outlaw cell phones, OK? <laughs> OK, because they're just destroying human society and like basically our brains because we can't think anymore. So it's, and that's why you need it, this factor in here because it, it accounts for the squeezing or stretching of the space, OK? So in a multidimensional space, if you scale it by n, then it really, the volume of the element increases by n by, by some quantity to the power n, where n is the dimensionality of the space, right? So this is beautiful, because it's going to turn out then, because everything's beautiful closed form, we can estimate. There's a thing called an AR model. We can estimate the minimum mean square error prediction coefficients, OK? You've got to do the homework problems and read the notes, OK? The homework problems are particularly important for this section, because they, there's some cute calculations that are fun to do, especially if there are a few hours of working on them, that um, uh, you only will learn if you do them yourself. It's sort of like that time you spent three months debugging a program, but after it, you'll never make the same mistake again. So you've got to do those homework problems. One of the things that's really important is this concept of a toplets matrix and a circlet matrix, OK? OK, I'll let you go. but. A toplets matrix is a matrix in which the, uh, the diagonals are constant, OK? It has the interpretation of being a space invariant linear filter. A circulant matrix is a toplet matrix, but a toplet matrix is not circulant always, OK? The reason is the difference is a circulant matrix has a circular boundary condition, OK? So you can do a space invariant convolution, but not have a circular boundary condition. That's a toplets matrix. If you have a circulant boundary condition, it's a circulant matrix. This is very important, because circulant matrices can be represented with DFTs, right? Toplets matrix cannot, 
but asymptotically they behave like DFTs. There's a really cool homework problem on that, okay? Finding the asymptotic distribution and the eigenvalues of a topless matrix, okay? And I'm spinning through this real fast because I'm going to try to move ahead because I don't want to get too far behind. Uh, okay, infinite impulse response. Okay, discrete time for it. Oh gosh, yeah, we'll try to hit some of this. I need to move ahead to the multi to two D case. Okay, next time we're going to pick up the two D case. So you've got to read the notes. Okay, promise me. Say, I promise you that I'll be a good student and I'll do what you ask and I'll try my best to read the notes. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>